So, okay. We're getting the uh, slides. Very good. Great pleasure to be here. I came in yesterday, last night, from Colombia, where I spent a few days uh, looking at the telecom and media business in Colombia. Uh, you may wonder in general what a futurist does, so I made a slide for this, just to understand what I do. Basically, I listen to the future. And this is, uh, if you have kids, you know, I have two kids, 16 and 22. There's a Chinese saying that says, if you want to know about the future, listen to your children. I, they know the future, so this is what I spend my time doing, sort of looking at trends in the next uh, three to five years. I help my clients reinvent what they do. There's lots of companies that we work with, media companies, technology companies, brands, and so on, trying to help them to sort of reposition for the future. Uh, I'm on Twitter, G. Leonhardt, so if you want to tweet something, I'll answer the question later. I will also post a PDF of my slideshow on Twitter later that you can download directly sometime this morning. So, you may know this guy, Marshall McLuhan, 1971. Right? Marshall McLuhan effectively predicted social media. He was talking about how uh, technology is creating sort of a global village, which is kind of funny because when we look at Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, you know, we have, in effect, the global village. But he said something very important. He said, essentially, it is a framework that changes, not the picture. So when we talk about social media today, we shouldn't talk about, you know, if we're going to have a, a Facebook profile or a social commerce or whatever you want to call it. Those are just uh, pictures. We have to look at the framework, right? And the framework really is that we're living in a world of disruption. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Uh, basically, on a daily basis, something is being disrupted. The music business, the television business, right? The newspaper business. I mean, we all have papers here on the table now, but will this be in five years? Will it be the same thing? In America, 40% decline of the newspaper business in the last two years, 71% decline of the music business. So I think we can safely say that whatever happens in media will happen to marketing. And there's quite a few people saying that actually we don't really need marketing if we have the internet. I don't know if that's correct or not, but because we can make a connection, right? We didn't have this before. We couldn't make a direct connection. Now we do. I'm getting excited, so I'm going to take my jacket off. Okay. Uh, basically, I think we're at the tip of the icebergs as far as, far as marketing is concerned. We're only here. We feel already quite disrupted. You know, when you're looking at all the changes in marketing, there's roughly one trillion dollar budget, marketing, advertising, data mining, public relations is shifting over to digital. Right? There's lots and lots of changes coming in this direction. But this is one motif that we're seeing across the, uh, the entire media and marketing industries is the, the sort of controlling entity is no longer us, the companies, the businesses, it's the user themselves. Right? This is a very big change. I mean, for example, now if you sit at the gate somewhere at an airport, if you're using an app called Flight Tracker on your mobile phone, you will know more about the flight that's departing than the woman at the gate. Okay? So they don't care, they don't want to know, but anyway, you could tell if the flight was canceled before the woman at the gate would know just by monitoring your flight on Flight Tracker. If you use TripAdvisor, in Germany, if you put your mobile phone on the table before you eat and you bring up the TripAdvisor app, you will guarantee to get better service. Because people see that you have the app, you have the power to say something. Right? That makes a big difference. So now this idea of a captive customer, you know, we use in marketing often the sort of military terms, you know, campaigns, uh, uh, implementation, uh, captive things, you know. So this is, I think, it's ending. We're basically going to a system failure if we're looking to capture people and to tie them down. I mean, for example, iTunes. Right? Do you guys use iTunes for buying music? Some people do still, okay? It's about 18 billion downloads in the last eight years. But iTunes is essentially a captive system. This is why you only have 2 or 3% of the entire population is using iTunes, even though it's cool, it works, right? It's expensive, of course, but it's a closed system. And take a more open system like YouTube. The kids today, when you go to a party, they don't download music to play for free. They play music from YouTube, right? Because it's an open system. It works, it's free, of course, it has links and so on. So 
we could safely say I think old style marketing was sort of like there's a quite a simple game, right? A chess game with two pieces. You know, a product, the user, play the game. Now we have a game like this. To where we can say now the users are all on one side and here's us on the other side trying to create a, a new kind of chess game, right? There's quite a difference there. I think the difference really is user control. Right. Of course, this is not new to us, but really, what, what does it mean when the user has control over what we're doing, spreading the message or changing something? For example, in television, where I do quite a bit of work, we have the rise of what we call social TV. Okay? This is television where people are connecting to each other. 42% of Americans are on the Internet doing something else while they watch TV. There's probably quite a few people in Norway doing the same thing, you know, Facebook or Twitter or whatever you're doing while you're watching TV. But this is the biggest trend, is that we do other things while we watch TV. In the UK, there's an app called ITV Life. It's part of ITV. And while you're watching the show, people are actually talking about it and Twittering more than ever before at the same time while they're watching. And really, this is what happens, you know, we're creating mountains of data about the content. Right? We're commenting, we're actually doing stuff. Um, and then, of course, it's mobile and it's you know, sort of on a global level to where we're all connecting. So social TV, you know, this is basically the biggest trend in television right now. The challenge is, of course, connected TV, social TV will also require connected marketing. In other words, if we're disconnected brands and we have connected marketing, then there's, there's a disconnect. Right? Why would you want to connect with users if you're not really interested in talking? This is a very big problem, of course, because now we're all talking about social media, social marketing, whatever that means, but we're not really ready to connect, right? I mean, this television allows, this is a Samsung television, allows us to install widgets where we can do other stuff. Somebody's at the dentist here next door, I think, or something. But we're actually not doing this in real life. We're not actually connecting in the same way. This, I think, is a very, very big issue in the future. So... If you're seeing what's working out in the last sort of 10 to 15 years is the web native stuff. Right? Things that start with the internet. And I, you know, I work a lot with clients who are old world clients, right? And they're like, this is not their world, right? Web native, for example, is a very simple example. Uh, web native is the BBC iPlayer in England, right? Where you can watch all the TV shows wherever you are. If you're a British citizen, you can watch catch-up television, right? That's a web-native idea. This app has 20% of the entire internet traffic in the UK at times, especially in the evening, right? And of course, it's publicly funded, so it's a little bit easier. Flipboard, many of you may be using Flipboard, right? On the iPad to read news. So starting with the internet, for example, Amazon, the Kindle, which now sells more books on the Kindle than in print, right? This is how quickly it went in just two or three years, right? The Kindle allows me to share my comments on books with other readers. This wouldn't be possible in real life. I mean, with real books, I'd have to send a fax or do something, write it down somewhere. Right? So I think today uh, a lot of success is primarily based on the question, can it be web native? Can it only work because we're connected? And this is quite a challenge for many clients who are actually not that connected in many ways, still thinking about things that are sort of band-aids on the Internet, right? Uh, this is taken from my first book about six years ago, but it's still very true. Is that we're moving from a world that had central entities to a world that is networked, right? From a one-to-many world to a many-to-many -many world. And I can attest to you right now, of course, the one-to-many won't go away. We'll have television. We'll have big companies. We'll have big banks. We'll have big government. That won't go away. But the many-to-many -many world is, is exploding with activities, and this is one thing that's kind of worrying because the many-to-many -many world is quite chaotic. It's noisy. Right? All these things are happening at the same time. This is very much a challenge, I think, if you're not 15. It's a challenge to deal with all the stuff that comes down on you at all times, right? the many-to-many -many world. As Marshall McLuhan said in 1971, the global village is not peace, harmony, and quiet. It's actually quite a chaos. Right? I mean, Twitter, for example, is the, the ultimate example of chaos, right? of noise. How do you filter this? How do you deal with the multitude of opinions there? But I think very soon noise making won't work. 
Because quite simply, we're not paying much attention to the noise any longer. Television advertising or newspaper advertising was kind of noise that we couldn't get rid of. Right? I mean, we go through the newspaper, it's, we're going to look at the ads one way or the other. But on the mobile phone, would we accept somebody intercepting us and pitching us with stuff that we don't want? Probably not. Right? We want to get rid of the noise. So here's a couple of things about the future that I have compiled. I think most importantly, I think advertising is essentially becoming content. I mean, if you're looking back at the really interesting ads that we've seen in the last few years, they're not really ads in the, in the, in the sense of saying, buy this, right? They're actually content. I mean, it goes, goes back to what, seven years ago, BMWfilms.com, if you remember, right? a film series, no logos at all, just, just the cars. Advertising is becoming content, and marketing is curation. Curation of ideas, curation of the process, curation of what we like, connecting people with ideas. Brands become publishers, that's kind of obvious. That's also obvious. But if you take all these five things together, then you can safely say this is sort of a pretty serious reboot. Right? Because marketing used to be about, you know, basically trying to find a way to sell something, to pitch something, to find the right target crowd. Now it's like a creative process. Now it's content, essentially. So marketers are content producers now. Maybe content producers are also marketers now. Lady Gaga, a month ago, she came up with this game called Gagaville. You guys know Farmville? I hope you don't know Farmville. It's, it's addictive. Your kids probably do, right? $350 million of revenues last year by buying virtual tractors and flowers on Farmville. I've bought a few. So I have a big tractor and carrots, nice juicy carrots. But Lady Gaga now has a game called Gagaville. Right? And you could argue this is, this is a game, but it's basically content. Right? It's, it's about what she does. Will we have Audiville? in the future? Probably. We already do, right? We have lots of apps you could download from Audi, which are essentially a bit like Audiville. Right? So, Kleiner Perkins, the original investor on Facebook, they summarized what's happening around the web a year ago. Mary Mika said, it's about social, it's about local, and it's about mobile. Solo Mo. And I would add to that video, of course. So, Solo Movie, whatever you want to call it. Right? I mean, it's a very simplified summary of what's happening, right? But this is where everything is shifting. And we're looking at roughly, as I was saying earlier, a trillion-dollar budget. One-third of that money will shift in this direction. The question is only when. It's not, it's not if. And, of course, all the countries are vastly different in their speed and the shift. I live in Switzerland, which is a lot like Norway. In fact, that the shift will take a little bit longer in Switzerland, right? Because we're a smaller population as well. So... I'm sure all of you already are quite aware of this. Mobile is the new normal. We're not talking about the internet anymore being on computers or on cable devices or you know, making a big effort to go online in parentheses. Now, mobile is the new normal. We are essentially looking at the entire world reorganizing for mobile effort. For example, you can see here business to business uh, things that are happening, widening networks, changing priorities, and so on. So basically, if you're looking at this graph, you can see most of the traffic on mobile networks will be coming from mobile connected devices. Tablets, smartphones, feature phones. In fact, I would say that as much as 90% of the entire online traffic will be done on mobile devices in the next five years. This is a very big shift because mobile device isn't the same. Computers are about work, primarily. So, on these devices, interruption just won't work. I mean, if, if your marketing is about interruption, then you're dead. Right? Because nobody will care about your interruptions on these devices. It's just way too personal. Right? You have to provide a bit more meaning. So one of the things I like to talk about, one of my memes, is that we're moving from this old society of broadcasting to a broadband society, a broadband culture. And this is really quite a different viewpoint, because in a broadband culture, it's no longer really about this. It's about the, the choices we have. It's about the connectivity, and it's about the mobile. Right? So we're basically moving into a society to where it's a bit more like this. 
I mean, if Marshall McLuhan would have had cool animations, he would have used this one, I think. <laughs> Basically, it's a wheel moving at the same time in different directions. It's much more complex now, and as Kevin Kelly says, the co-founder of Wired Magazine, in this world, it's about streams. It's not about downloads. It's about the cloud, it's about now, it's about us, and it's about data. If you zoom back just 10 years ago, it wasn't about streams, it was about downloads. Right? It was about pages, it was about search. Right? This is quite a different lifestyle that people have and how we reach them for marketing purposes. Right? In the network society, in the broadband culture, it's where we have, of course, what's called the app economy. You know, people connecting on applications that fit for them. We have things like Dropbox, which uses an interesting marketing approach. If I invite somebody else to Dropbox, many of you may be using Dropbox for the iPad, right? then Dropbox gives me more storage space. So this is an interesting way of looking at how they do the marketing through others. Right? Uh, many hotels are now taken to Twitter and Facebook as real-time information of quality. Right? So Starwood Hotels has a Twitter map where you can go and see what people are saying about the hotel as they check in. I mean, talk about drastic transparency, right? They can't afford to make any mistakes with this app. Right? I mean, I'm going to change my mind when I check in, when I see what other people have twittered about this. So in broadband culture, this is really quite a different way of how we look at the world. I mean, video becoming a default. You see, as much as 80% of web traffic is now driven by video. Every company has a video feed now. Right? I mean, the, all the top Fortune 100 companies have video channels, video feeds, video interviews, podcasts, you know, all the stuff. For example, the Wall Street Journal now is essentially a television station online, right? not the paper, of course. Right? So as uh, Kevin Kelly says, a television that you can read and newspapers you can watch. Uh, this is the, the shift that we're going in media. I mean, if you're looking at uh, museums now, they're going online with uh, video shows. Swiss Air had a video competition who would sing the best song about San Francisco. I mean, video is becoming a standard. And clearly, all of us love to send around cool videos. So it's, a, you know, it's an obvious fit to what people like to do. Over-the-top television. How many of you are watching, for example, TED.com or Fora TV? or Big Think, or Hulu, or Netflix, or whatever can, you can, it's over-the-top television is exploding, going directly from brands to consumers. Again, if you have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about now. We're people of the screen now. We're no longer people of the book. Which is kind of sad, in fact, because I love books, and I sell books, and I wrote books. <laughs> I would like, like people to buy my actual book, right? But now we're people of the screen. And we're acting completely different. I mean, the screen is everywhere. It's in the car. It's in the airplane. It's, of course, in our pockets. It's everywhere. There are estimates saying that we'll have over 7 billion connected screens in the next two years. I mean, people connecting on all kinds of devices, including at times where they shouldn't. Now we have pilots. Instead of carrying the handbook, they have an iPad. And, of course, they're doing other things on the iPad as well, right, because it's connected. Right? So people of the screen are entirely different people. Look at this. The music industry in 10 years, 71% decline. And why is that? Not because we hate music. Not because we're too cheap to pay. Not true. Not because there isn't any good music. Right? Because these people of the screen are different. They act different. Right? They consume differently. So finally, years ago, two years ago, we have Spotify. I think you have that here in Norway, right? Which is a cloud-based music service. That's what people want. It took 10 years for that to happen. You know, good example of disruption. A little bit hard to see in this slide, just two main things, right? In the mobile world, you know, the connectivity is amazing. 7.1 billion devices connected 203 times the amount of data coming through. So we're essentially going to an era where we can safely say it's probably the end of the PC as an Internet device. So all the stuff that we've done on web pages, on computers, that was just all foreplay as far as marketing and advertising is concerned. Now, since the iPhone two or three years ago, 
what we market, how we market is being completely reinvented. And it will take a lot of creativity to deal with this part of things. Clearly, I mean, research again from Morgan Stanley here showing that mobile marketing is by far the most efficient way to market, no matter which way you look at it. Reach, targeting, engagement, clearly true. But when you go to a client, they're saying, like, you know, I'm not so sure that's, you know, I like the stuff that we used to have. Right? So there's quite a discrepancy that we have to tackle. We're also becoming people of the cloud. You heard about cloud computing, right? Sounds kind of geeky. But really what it is that everything that we do, films, television, education, health, all the stuff that we do is moving into the cloud. So we can access it pretty much anywhere we want to. Our health records at the doctor in the hospital, our education. And people of the cloud expect their life to be instant, right? It's called nowness. You know, that's sort of a, a key term, right? So, for example, if I go to London, I want to eat sushi, I don't buy the Guide Michelin. I don't go to Google. I go to search.twitter.com or I use Quipe or TripAdvisor. But if I go to search.twitter.com and I type in Sushi London, I will get live reviews from people. And in some cases, when I go there, they're still sitting at the table. That's called nowness. I'm interested in what's happening now, not what happened last year, except, of course, if I want to do research. But this is really what's happening now pretty much across the planet in terms of news. Twitter takes 21 seconds to deliver the latest news to us. Television takes 46 minutes because they have to go there and set up a camera. Now, Twitter does not. So the, na the next edition of the iPhone has complete Twitter integration. Imagine what this will mean for marketing. Instant reviews, opinions, likes, all published immediately. In a way, you could say this is Darwinism. Right? I mean, this is putting up a lot of pressure on the provider of whatever it is. Right? I mean, whatever I'm going to say to you now, pretty soon you can just push a button and sink the ship. Right? I mean, imagine what this will do to anybody, even a guy who sells hamburgers on the street. The latest Twitter commercial, right, basically says that you can find out about the earthquake before it arrives on your end, right, because it's so quick. But that, that kind of shows what happens now, you know, now becomes the default, and people are using screens, of course, and, you know, we have to be prepared for instant responses, even if it's just a wink or a comment, right. I mean, the instant responses are going to explode. I will touch on this a little bit later, but one of the things that it really means is that we are pretty much at the end of lying. And many brands, many companies, of course, they have things that they prefer not to be talked about. But now it's basically all there. Right? It's going to be very hard for us to filter this down to a place to where we can be comfortable with whatever people are saying. Here's a great app that I used in Istanbul the other day called Wizard in Istanbul, where you can ask any question about what's happening or what you could be doing in Istanbul and get an instant response through a bunch of experts through Twitter. Right. So it's like a live service. You can ask, you know, this restaurant open or what is the rating and so on. Right. It's basically this whole idea of personalization, of content, location. Right. That's becoming a standard. Here's a television app that you can use on a Samsung TV to put together your customized car, a car configurator. This used to be geek stuff on Facebook or on an app. Right Now it's going to be on television. So you can watch a movie where the car is used in the movie, and then if, when you're done, you can configure your car and have it sent to you with an offer or a test drive. This is all stuff that we used to do, you know, sort of on the geeky side, but pretty soon it'll be our mothers doing it. One trend that we're seeing, I think this was Business Week, I think, seven years ago, 
They're talking about the, the mass markets as in the long tail. You, I'm sure you read the book. Huh? But we're finally here. We're probably going to see the end of mass anything. Mass music, mass markets, mass television. It doesn't mean it will go away. It will just become less relevant. For example, here we can see uh, going to 2008 only, unfortunately, is that more and more people are going to more and more different locations for travel. That's the, the, uh, the red line. So we're all fragmenting. I mean, we're basically becoming a society that has a lot less mass culture than we used to. This is a major challenge for marketing because we want numbers. We want people to buy lots of our stuff. How are we going to reach them if we only have 4% audience reach? This is quite a challenge for us. Then we have this convergence of on and offline. I mean, in reality, you know, there is no such thing as offline. We're always connected. And offline is now a mental state. In other words, you're not willing to connect. Okay? Which happens and should happen, right? But this is a Facebook thing in Israel where you can go down a slide and you're wearing a wristband and you can like the slide. Right? This is our kids are doing this, but very soon it's going to be becoming normal. A Twitter mirror where you can go to a store and tweet a photo and then your friends can say if you should buy the dress through Twitter. I'll give you feedback. Starbucks, of course, has long connected the online and the offline with these apps. Here's the, the mirror that you can post on Facebook called the Tweet Mirror. and uh, It's quite bizarre, but people are doing this. Right? There's no such thing as online and offline any longer. And in five years, we'll be basically, I mean, online and offline will be a concept like, you know, fax versus telephone or something. And all these geeky things, the barcode, the QR, and the GPS, and all these kind of things, they become completely normal. So as far as marketing goes, we are also looking at this challenge of, of really coming up with convergent marketing ideas. Uh, Pepsi has been a very good leader in this. There's been lots of really interesting stuff coming from Pepsi. For example, this social vending machine. Have you seen that one? Looks like this. Okay, you can throw money in there. And, ha and sent a friend a Pepsi in any other town in the U.S. Right? And it works for the mobile, right? So you basically go to the machine, you put in the mobile code, and you get a gift from your friend in New York right, to the Pepsi machine. That's called social vending. Okay. And again, I probably wouldn't do this. But when you think about the trend, what that means is that in many ways now, this idea of convergent reality, online, offline, that's going to become a standard. So Google Plus, many of you may have tried it, right? But Google Plus is teaching us a good lesson, right? And the lesson really is that there's a lot of stuff happening at the same time, and we are seriously confused with all the multiple inputs, right? So now marketing, in my view, is curating commerce. It's just like when you go to the, to the museum. If you had all, what, 300 dollies hanging there, it would be extremely overwhelming. You don't. You only have three. And you have two others. You have curation. This is the challenge when you go to Las Vegas to a buffet of food. And you have 150 meters of food. Who is going to curate the dinner for you? I hate buffets for that reason. That's a paradox of choice. And you're going to eat too much. That's the other thing, of course. Right? So now it's about curating commerce. You're going to buy too much. Otherwise, I think marketing really is sense-making now. I mean, there has been, of course, a great example of Apple is that, in a way, Apple makes sense out of these things for us. It makes it easy, cuts it down to, like, only the permitted actions, right? It makes it so much easier because it's a closed system. Right? So there's a lot of curation happening at Apple that, for example, isn't so much happening in the Android system. Right? So I think marketing becomes sense-making. And in this world that we're living in, where basically the television is going to split into tens of thousands of options. And that's already happening. I mean, I have a constant argument with my wife about getting rid of cable television because I don't need it. I can watch anything I want through the web. We're now living in a fragmented world that looks like this. So the future of marketing is basically the mission has to be we have to be much better at targeting. Right? We have to make better matches. We have to get better data. So if you're looking at companies that have been successful for this, 
you can sort of argue that basically they had one thing in common is that the product is the marketing. That's the Kindle, the Nike Plus, and Skype. And that's also not new, but now on the web, we're going to see a drastic uh, development with this becoming sort of a standard. Look at the Kindle curve, right? Why is the Kindle so successful? Because it speaks for itself. The product is the marketing. And Amazon has a very simple motto I think would also fit for future campaigns that we're thinking about is that basically it's about extreme customer satisfaction. And they are really good at this. That's something I think that we're going to see pretty much on a global level. And there's an upcoming book from Rohit Bhagwa uh, talking about what we call likeonomics. Right? The idea of saying that basically what matters most is to be liked. Of course, that's also not new, but now on the web and the mobile commerce, that's really kind of obvious. So I think the future belongs to companies that matter, not the ones that are the cheapest or the noisiest or the loudest, right? but the ones that matter. Here's an example, American Express. Right. What they're doing on Twitter and the open forum on mobile devices, adding value. I mean, I'm not entirely sure that American Express will matter to me in the future because I probably won't be using credit cards in five years. I'll be using mobile devices to pay. But it's a very good example of how, I, of how you can put yourself in the position to matter. Um, Chinese saying that goes right with this is basically saying that you can do all these things, but really what matters most is to involve people. And the most successful campaign in Brazil that I've looked at last year in person is this uh, campaign from Fiat, right? building a car for Brazil. They actually involved the users to build this new Fiat 500, the Brazilian version. And this has been the most successful car in Brazil. And it's not a very good car. But people love the idea of building this car and getting involved in deciding what it is. And these are not gimmicks. I think, of course, in many ways, they could be considered a gimmick, sort of a, a better mousetrap, right? But they reflect, I think, where people want to get involved. They want to get engaged. They want to have a word in. And, and there's a couple trends I want to share with you on this. First. I think we're going to see a hugely increased role of technology. So in fact, if you're in marketing, you're becoming half a technologist, you could argue, because many of these things have to do with some sort of interesting new technology that you're putting to use. And this is actually quite hard when you think about that marketing usually is not the same thing as knowing about geeky stuff. It's also about emerging cultural practices. Here you see a guy who's using a QR code, a quick response code, Right, uh, or several people, to scan products. Right? But of course, if you were in the restaurant scanning your wine bottles QR, you would be considered to be kind of weird. Right? But in Japan, for example, when you go on a date, it means nothing to scan the face of a woman and pull up her social network profile. It's normal right? to decide if you want to continue the conversation. Right? That would be extremely strange here. So these are cultural things. But if you want to know where the future is going, look for emerging cultural practices. I think that's quite obvious. I mean, all this stuff is going to happen. The question is, of course, in which context and which culture it becomes acceptable. The new iPhone will have a feature called the recognizer. This is already widely put in place. Okay? Basically, what it means is that all of us that have any web page, any Facebook profile, any corporate web page, any Twitter, anything will be recognized automatically by whoever wants to. This is a very scary thought, right? But this technology exists already. I mean, the idea of being recognized does have its merits, but also has issues that we in Europe are saying, like, oh, I'm not so sure I want people to scan me everywhere I go and pull up my profiles, right? So that's a big issue, I think, privacy. And then we have, of course, the fact that consumers are using more and more technology. As you can see here with BlackBerry, right? this is BlackBerry's biggest problem. They're looking towards business, but people are looking towards you know, personal use of devices. Right? So you see, for example, what they're selling in terms of consumers. I mean, this is the problem for BlackBerry, total decline in the business market. Right? Very good example for looking in the wrong, barking up the wrong tree, you could say. 
Right? Now we have consumers using what businesses used to use, cloud computing, mobile devices. Right? You have consumers using hardcore technology. So now because of this, the consumer becomes this really interesting individual. You could say, actually, I, I sometimes call them the people formerly known as consumers. Because now they're all of these things. They're producers, they're participants, they're community, depending on who you talk to. The most common question I get from people is saying, like, okay, is this right or wrong? Should we do this or should we do that? Right? And the question I have to give many times is like, it depends. I mean, this is a, an honest answer, right? In the fact that you probably can make very few rules now about what could work and what couldn't, given that consumers are starting to look like this. So this is, I think, a benefit for us as people is that there is going to be a lot more roles for human creativity. We can use machines to do all kinds of things, data mining and matching and all these things, but in the end, it will come down to a creative act. Right? Something that tries to figure out what exactly is the frame that we're trying to catch. It also comes down to good storytelling. And I think this is a great news, I think, for us in this business. Despite all the technology, all the data mining, all of the machine intelligence, right, we're going to be much more into storytelling any which way you look at it. Using, of course, a multimedia, cross-media approach. An Indian saying, which is very true now, in the age of social media, it takes a thousand voices to tell a single story. If you can get a thousand voices to tell your story, you have a big success. And this is actually quite hard to do because how do you get a thousand voices? You can't pay them, right? you can't force them, you can only attract them to tell your story. And that is part of the challenge. So as part of this uh, development, you probably know the uh, the blend, I think it's called Blend Tech, the company, right? Blending iPhones, and you've seen the commercials, right? That's branded content that will explode. American Express again, uh, Marriott, Facebook Games, Pepsi. Right? Pepsi has just launched a new campaign funding uh, 10 new business ideas called the Pepsi10.com. You can go and check it out. But see what... what uh, the chief engagement officer is saying of Pepsi is saying, we want to become a catalyst in culture rather than just a big brand. This is a, a pretty substantial claim here, of course. How do you become a catalyst in culture? But humanize brands. Right? We have so many machines, so much artificial intelligence, so much technology that now we're interested in humanized brands right? and something that becomes tangible. Then we're going to face this major shift in the next three years. Automated translation. I've seen it work already at the Google Apps, but basically what it means is that I can speak to you in German, you'll hear it in whatever, whatever language you're interested in, whether it's Chinese or Norwegian or whatever, in real time. Text and spoken. That means, for example, television. I can watch any television ad in whatever language I want to see in the next three years. This is a major shift that's going to happen in the next three years. This is a Microsoft commercial on the same topic, a girl speaking in English, a boy seeing it in Thai. You can see that or look at it or use it on a web page. I mean, already works on web pages. And this is a major shift, I think, for media. When you think about, for example, in Norway, people speak Norwegian in Norway, right? but not in South Africa. So in three years, people can read your Norwegian content anywhere in the world, in whatever language. Major shift there. Augmented reality is the next GPS, next car navigation. I don't know if you tried augmented reality, but it's basically about holding up a mobile phone to a, an object or something with a barcode or whatever and being able to see superimposed information, like here, holding it over a crowd in a museum, at McDonald's, outside in magazines, and of course with advertising. If you haven't looked at augmented reality, you should. This is the next GPS. It's the next standard for information. So a word on the social networks. I mean, social networks, as you know, Facebook is approaching the 1 billion user mark. Facebook will go public next year and fetch an estimated $100 billion in a public offering. 
Essentially, social networks are the next broadcasters. They're the next radio and television. Think about this for a second. Facebook is essentially broadcasting us to each other. So whatever I tell you, you can read it, and then my fans can read it, but it's like a small broadcast channel. Very soon, Facebook and other networks, and there's about 10 of the same size as Facebook, are becoming broadcasters of television, Facebook TV, Twitter News Network, TNN, will be the next CNN. So social networks are broadcasters. And whatever your message is to your consumers, you have to use these new broadcasting platforms. Right? I mean, these are going to become a standard. I mean, Zuckerberg already said this three years ago. We have the most important distribution platform that has been made in a generation. We may have lots of issues with Facebook, but we also have issues with broadcasters. Right? So I think this is becoming the future for us. You know, Facebook is the new TV, cable TV without the cable. So clearly that's a platform that we're going to... I mean, look at the numbers here in terms of growth of Facebook, Facebook money, Batman you can watch on Facebook, Al Jazeera you can watch on Facebook already. The Arab Spring we could watch on Facebook. We can watch Spotify, listen to Spotify on Facebook. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Facebook is the third largest country in the world outside of China and India. So what we're seeing here is basically this is the next generation of television. This is going to put the fear of God into television people, of course, right? because basically what's going to happen here is that we have a cable TV network without the cable, without the cost, without the license. So I call this sometimes, I hate the word social media. I'm sure you hate the word social media as well, right? Because it doesn't mean anything, really. But really what we're talking about here is it's a social operating system, a social OS. It's the way that we connect to each other is becoming fundamentally social. I bet you money here, most people that are on LinkedIn, there's probably many of you on LinkedIn, right? if you go to the next meeting, what do you do before you go to the meeting? you check out the guy's profile on LinkedIn or on Facebook. That's called a social operating system because you're going to see some stuff. This person went to school in Oslo or in New York or wherever. You're going to use that information in the conversation. It becomes a social way of interacting that transcends whether it's business or private. This brings me to a very important point, also not new but really powerful now is that data is the new oil. And this was mentioned in 2006 by somebody from the American Advertising Association. But literally today, or until today, wars were fought over oil, and the future will have wars over data. I mean, hopefully not real wars, but wars of attention. All the stuff that we're generating, our location, our likes, our recommendations, our past purchase history, our web pages, all this stuff becomes extremely powerful information could be used and app used for many things. Right? But basically what's happening now is that marketing becomes the art of using this data and, of course, of mining it. So very much like the island drilling out in the ocean, now we're sort of looking at information being marketed and drilled out and, and distilled and used, made into gas. The New York Times wrote about this a couple of weeks ago. It's saying that we're all sort of bleeding data now. Many of us are worried, of course, about what this means. Do we become naked? Can everybody see what we're doing? These are, of course, big issues that will play out, but it comes down to this. It's about value and permission. If you provide value in return for data, and if you accept that you need to ask for permission, then I think it's a very good story for the future. You can say what you want about Google, for example, right? but you can go to a Google page and you can find it and wipe out all of the user data with one keystroke. I mean, all of the stuff that they have, of course, not the distributed things. Right? But it's about permission. I think marketing, of course, is about permission. I think basically if you abuse privacy, it's a death penalty. And it's going to get much worse in the future. So many of us will be looking very carefully at, at how we can get people to opt in to give us information because permission will be sacred. The Huffington Post allows me to log in with my social network. 
So when I get to the Huffington Post, I have all my friends around making comments and showing me new stuff, right? But if the Huffington Post took this and posted on my profile a pitch that they have made for, for an ad, right, I would be gone in a second. And therein lies the difference. We have a lot more control here, right, because we have the right of revoking our permission. That brings me to the next important point that I have to wrap up and, and do a summary. Very important here is I think we're looking at the end of lying. And let's be honest, you know, as brands, there's always a little bit of lying that we do because there's a few things that didn't quite work out. I mean, this was just part of life. I mean, I worked in the music industry for a long time and 90% of that was lying. Right? It's because it doesn't actually pan out. There's things that we don't want in public. I mean, we don't want a constant WikiLeaks around our work. But now the reality is that people can look through this and they can say, for example, Domino's Pizza in the US. They realized that essentially they were always pitching how good the pizza was and not a single person was believing it. I mean, basically, it looked like this. People talked about Domino's Pizza having the worst pizza ever, like cardboard and so on. So they realized they have to stop lying. They have to actually make a better pizza. So they came up with this. Called, called the pizza, what is it called? The pizza turnaround. <laughs> they called the pizza turnaround to reinvent their pizza. They decided not to continue lying and tell people to buy their good pizza, but to actually make a new pizza. And this is a very big trend I think that we're going to see in the future. Rupert Murdoch, who would have thought that this guy would run an ad, whole page ad saying, we're sorry. So now it's basically about strong brands will need to practice extreme transparency. WikiLeaks or not doesn't make a difference. Right? We have to be transparent. There's no choice. As a final important point, I think that we're going to see for consumers a trend towards what I call the digital detox. Yeah. I mean, of course, I'm 50 years old. I like this idea of going offline and not getting messages, right? But I think this is a new luxury that people were saying, you know what, I am not going to connect now. In fact, now there's hotels that you can go to and they guarantee that you can't have a wireless network. You can't get an SMS or use the BlackBerry as blocked. And you pay for that. Right? Remember 10 years ago when we were in hotels, we were saying, oh, we can't get online. You guys don't have wireless. You sucks. Yeah. And, and now we're so happy when people are saying you can't do anything. You just, just enjoy the dinner. Right? And this is going to be a trend, of course. Right? So we have to be sure that we, we capture people at the right time and not overwhelm them. So I'll give you a brief summary, and then we have maybe time for a question or two. Marketing 2.0 looks like this. Right? We're down here, right? and the other guys are over there. We have to figure out how to play a better chess game. And we have to figure out how to deal with this new army of empowered users. Right? To me, I mean, I work with lots of brands on this topic. I think every time you can empower the consumer with a better product, a better campaign, or some sort of involvement, you're always better off. The key question is whether the client can do it, right? If they actually are believing the story that they have to empower the consumer. This is a big change, of course. We're living now in a many-to-many -many world. Again, this doesn't mean that one-to-many is going away. It's not. We watch YouTube and we have MTV. Right? But think about the relative importance of MTV today. Right? Is MTV the place where you find new music? No. Maybe for some people it is, but it's not as YouTube. But we still have both. Social, local, mobile. That's sort of like the roadmap for the future. Again, I estimate between 30 and 40% of all funds for campaigns for marketing to shift in this direction. I mean, this is going to be a tidal wave of change in terms of our creativity and what we do. Brands that can change. People want brands that can change. They can say that we're sorry. You know, we messed up. We'll give you something. I mean, Amazon is great at this. Right? They bought Zappos, one of the most important companies in this term. I mean, brands that can change are what people like. Data is the new oil. This is a top-line topic, right? Because, I mean, we're looking at a situation where, where data is becoming 
essentially the kingmaker. Then it's about value and permission. So marketing to people doesn't mean marketing, you know, yelling at them. It means getting permission to use what they do. To me, marketing becomes more like sense making rather than a uh, support of selling. The end of mass anything. This is probably our toughest challenge because we like mass markets and big numbers, right? But now it's all about niches and success in niches. Lyconomics. I'm looking forward to his book. I don't really know what the book says. I just love the term, but I think his book is coming out sometime later this year. But it's a very good term, I think, to think about marketing in the future. And the summary from the beginning, advertising is content, marketing is curation. I think that's what we're going to see in the very near future. I want to thank you very much for your attention. And um, I do have a bunch of stuff on the web. My apps are free. All my books can be downloaded for free. Just go to mediafuturist.com or Google GERD, G-E-R-D, and free PDF, and you'll find my stuff. Thanks very much.